Friends, today we are privileged to have with us a very renowned public health expert and epidemiologist, Dr. Raman Ganga Khetkar. He is former head of the Division of Epidemiology and Communicable Diseases at the Indian Council of Medical Research, and he has also served as director in charge of the National AIDS Research Institute in Pune. He was a member of the National Task Force on COVID-19 and the recipient of the 2020 Padma Shri Award, the fourth highest civilian award in India. And above all, he's a member of the World Health Organization's expert group to study the origins of emerging and re-emerging pathogens of concern, including the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. A very warm welcome to you, sir. And uh, sir, vaccine hesitancy and lack of confidence in vaccines is not new. In India, what were the reasons for COVID vaccine hesitancy? And were they different from community <coughs> to community or place to place? No, there, there are a couple of things which I would say. Uh, India was no different when it comes to uh, you know, people having vaccine hesitancy. Perhaps it was more accentuated due to the fact that in the Western world, the phase three trials were completed. Whereas in India, phase two trials had just completed and the entire approval process actually hinged on the immunogenicity related data, whether the vaccine is able to provoke immune response appropriately. The result, people did not know the actual efficacy of that vaccine in terms of preventing infection or for that matter, preventing the risk of hospitalization and death. Naturally, there would be an anxiety whether our vaccines are going to develop because globally the fear was that within a year's time, the vaccine has been developed, whereas it would require close to about 10 to 12 years of time to develop any vaccine from the laboratory to actually being given to individuals per se. Now, that was one of the most important reasons. The second reason, perhaps, we have to keep at the back of mind is in this particular vaccine, we adopted an at-risk approach. And in at-risk approach, who were the people to whom this vaccine was to be provided? We said those who were at risk of acquiring COVID and their services were as much required. So we prioritized healthcare workers and frontline workers. Now, just imagine the kind of fear that it would have had evoked among the healthcare workers who understand how vaccine trials are done, what are the processes of vaccine approval, and you suddenly come across that the vaccine has only uh, passed only phase two trials and we don't have data on efficacy. So those healthcare workers then perhaps show revealed perhaps a huge amount of vaccine hesitancy. They took their own time to actually accept it. And when that starts happening, it percolates to the other people because these are the people who are going to advocate for uh, use of COVID vaccine. And naturally, that also played a very important role in uh, increasing the vaccine hesitancy to my mind. And that's why if you actually remember we moved from that at-risk approach. We had kept on adding newer groups very quickly in the initial period because the hesitancy was very high among healthcare workers and frontline workers. The third thing which is also important for us to understand is were there any regional differences? Perhaps I don't see any regional differences playing a major role in the beginning uh, when the vaccine was uh, approved. There may be smaller a smaller kind of uh, variations that you must have had, uh, observed and they are mainly related to the access to the vaccine rather than or access to the places where they may have to travel and get those vaccines rather than anything else uh, at this juncture. There, there are reports that some people uh, try to try to uh, give some kind of a fake news whereby they would say that uh, these vaccines 
are not allowed. They contain certain substances which are not allowed uh, uh, by their religion. And therefore, uh, we should not take vaccines. But I think overall, people did not pay much of attention to that because the fear and the concern about this pandemic was so high. At that juncture, perhaps anything that was coming by uh, prevailed more over uh, these issues. And at the same time, the WhatsApp messaging that was occurring, it also played a huge role because in, a, in social media, there used to be a lot of discussions whether somebody died or somebody developed some kind of complication. And one simple news of this kind, there is no way you can actually try and verify the facts. And when you cannot verify the facts, you tend to treat this as truth. E even if they were true, you know, that some conditions, disease conditions did occur because of vaccine administration or they were seen concurrently. Though we may not be able to attribute the entire episode to uh, the administration of vaccine, it is possible you know, that these could be concurrent conditions or attributable to vaccine. But still, we do not, people cannot understand the denominator. You know, when you actually see one case being reported, we tend to overlook how many cases actually did not have did, did not have any kind of adverse event that was associated with it, which was a severe adverse event. Now, when you don't look at such denominators, you will essentially uh, try think of uh, think and interpret the whole thing as this could happen to me, which is not uh, which is not something which was easy to dispel because there are no known models. You know, though there were channels that were created, there was a there was a, government of India had also produced one social media site whereby they used to come out saying in PIB that this is a fake news um, after verification of the facts. But when the atmosphere is full of tension, when there are doubts in the mind, it is difficult to dispel those fears. I think they played an important role in enhancing vaccine hesitancy in India. So do you think the messaging could have been better, uh, the messaging which went out to the public or the steps taken uh, before the vaccine rollout began and after, once it had begun, should the public have been informed better about why is it important to have the vaccine? And also, uh, because, sir, I found there was a lot of misconception, as you're saying that, <coughs> excuse me, one news traveling from another, that somebody said that uh, the, a person took a vaccine and still he or she fell ill. But uh, actually the vaccine never promised that it will prevent the infection. So do you think that message did not go out to the public very well? Um, <laughs> one statement which I must make, in hindsight, mm. you know, all of us become experts. Mm. But the reality is when you are fighting a war against a pandemic that was spreading rapidly, and the fear was you have 150 crore, 35 crore population to protect. And just imagine if, if we were to spend more time in messaging, community preparedness, all those kinds of exercises, the fear at that juncture was, you know, if Delta-like wave would have had occurred in the first wave itself, so what would happen? There would have been so many deaths. So basically, you know, it is easy for us to now say that perhaps this was not done. But what is important for us to understand is in ideal circumstances, you would like to have community preparation, preparedness as an exercise. Community should have had been mobilized. But one must also take cognizance of the fact that mobilizing community, when you were under a lockdown for almost six months of period, the fear is high, nobody wants to meet each other. Now, how do you raise uh, the awareness about these vaccines? And I personally feel that the issue related to the knowledge that was being transferred to people was not 
all that bad no as people tend to criticize no what is most important is they advocated correctly the issue was was that or at a sustained level no sustained level was not possible <laughs> at that juncture when you rolled out you know as the time passed by you saw that the community mobilization exercise was taking place better you saw newer kinds of approaches where you know the prime minister suddenly started giving slogans you know which were supporting the vaccine because as a opinion leader perhaps he was the most tallest leader to advocate for vaccine he himself going for the first time when it came to people who were older than uh, 60 years you know uh, he went himself and took that particular vaccine these were these were examples to mobilize community you also saw that uh, there was a process where they had those booths you no know? once you take a vaccine you take a photograph uh, in that particular booth these were very important things because basically it was to promote the promote among people that vaccine should be taken and they are going to protect you the most important thing which we also should not forget that our scientific literacy is very low you no know, our science related literacy or you know any treatment literacy or vaccine literacy is so low that even if you were to go out and uh, try to tell everything about vaccines i, I am not very confident how people would have had understood because these messages about vaccines were already there but the atmosphere was such a difficult thing to handle that we when you have messages about adverse events that were spreading across in the community the issue was it was all left to people to decide whether what the government is saying is correct or the whatsapp message that i have received is correct these things tend to be difficult to handle but overall if you actually look back i think we the number of dosages that we have administered are immensely higher than most of the people could have had imagined remembering one fact that this was first major roll out where adult vaccination was being done even our systems were not used to adult vaccination of that kind i would always say that we did well in terms of providing there were there were uh, there was a resistance there was a hesitancy which we had to counter but compare that with the other vaccines which which found vaccine hesitancy as one phenomena we perhaps overcame the, that particular issue far faster compared to the earlier uh, experiences that had with vaccines okay uh, sir we would like you to share your reflections and insights about what about uh, lessons learned for future vaccine rollouts and pandemic preparedness as you said in hindsight it is uh, easy to criticize but in hindsight it, we also learn some lessons as to what went well and what could have been done better so for future what would you list something which uh, should be done or should not be done no first thing which i feel is uh, in india we had to rely on old technology because i remember those days uh, at that time you know, we people were developing different uh, vaccines on different vaccine platforms uh, unfortunately we did not have those platforms whether you talk of mrna whether you talk of adenovirus based vaccines or anything protein subunit vaccines so we had to rely on uh, a whole inactivated vaccine and that's the reason why we shared uh, the virus with bharat biotech to develop co vaccine because we had no choice uh, there were no vaccine development platforms that were available the way we started now uh, even for adenovirus based covishield we had to we had to go to oxford uh, Uh, university and try to negotiate with them that uh, we should uh, we should collaborate with india hoping 
that perhaps they will they will market that vaccine and fortunately for us they didn't have manufacturing facilities so serum came along but what would be the most important step we have to invest in rapid vaccine development platforms now of different kind that that would be one of the most essential steps in uh, pre preparedness against the pandemic that may come in future the uh, second most important thing which we have to understand since we are talking about vaccine hesitancy is time that we have to adopt an approach of regulatory approvals which would be far more transparent since pe people questioning the approval process itself became an important issue uh, in public domain i think now on perhaps we have to reflect on whether we follow the us fda approach where they actually have a public hearing uh, when any drug or uh, vaccine is being approved and anybody could ask any kind of question no that that is second thing third thing no uh, if you actually reflect on that in these vaccine development processes we bypassed or we actually try to develop far more accelerated program of vaccine development or drug development over what we have been used to even in hiv the result is if we are to adopt such a rapid accelerated uh, program of development now it is time we reflect and try to think in terms of what are the key changes that i will have to incorporate in that entire approach like here we went from immunogenicity data to use of vaccine now how efficient was it what we could have had done do we have a sufficient infrastructure as of now to do adaptive trials very quickly uh, in the population do we do we think we will be able to monitor the quality of uh, uh, this clinical trial or vaccine trial that is being undertaken uh, through the remotely you know, because when you had lockdown there was no way <clears throat> people could have traveled and monitored the whole thing how do you <clears throat> record the adverse events per se and still be confident of the uh, that they will pass the audits uh, nationally as well as internationally so there are multiple issues how you will have to mobilize the community very quickly uh, if such a thing happens how to maintain that balance of ethics no that because when you say that a new vaccine has come there would be large proportion that would say i want the vaccine and there would be a, a, another group that would say i don't want the vaccine now these rigid positions actually are a reflection that when you conduct these trials you will have people who are eager to take vaccine if they are going to be eager is that rational <laughs> do they understand risk benefits so there would be multiple issues which we will have to cover uh, when we reflect upon but there is no right and wrong thing as of now when you reflect on the past no past is past is done we have to just take the positive lessons from any gap that we have identified and be prepared to fight against vaccine hesitancy emerging subsequently and one can actually say, try <clears throat> try even in h1n1 the influenza vaccine you, know, you find that in maharashtra you provide influenza vaccine free of cost to pregnant women and healthcare workers because of the h1n1 problem <laughs> the uptake is hardly any 3% uptake among adults even pregnant women they don't take the healthcare workers don't take i think we we have to learn lesson that for for our h1n1 we started in 2009 we have not reflected well and change use that opportunity to understand how adult vaccines can be rolled out now at least you no know, when we face covid pandemic we should not lose this opportunity to make our systems robust to fight with diseases subsequently 
very well said, doctor, because uh, adult vaccination has always till now been taken a backseat. And as you said that uh, because this was a vaccine meant for uh, adults, then uh, we were really ill prepared on that account also. Because uh, I have seen even in the medical fraternity, like personally, I have started taking the flu vaccine annually for the last three, four or five years, four or five years. And the first time I asked, then uh, there were many uh, healthcare uh, professionals who said, well, why do you need it? What's the need for you to have that vaccine? So you are right. And But now we are seeing uh, more messaging around it, at least uh, in some hospitals, at least the private hospitals, we see those signages that please get uh, yourself the flu vaccine at least first. And I think pneumococcal vaccine is another vaccine, which again, for adults is uh, not that popularized. So uh, again, coming to disease prevention, sir, uh, it has not had enough attention. I'm not talking only of India, but elsewhere and also for uh, other infectious diseases other than COVID-19. COVID-19 was a, a new infection. And uh, even in the COVID-19 response, the basic preventive effects, whatever we could have taken, like wearing of masks, et cetera, uh, to break the chain of transmission, they got undermined. And now, of course, uh, we don't find the, most of the people we don't find uh, uh, following them. Then the global TB report also shows that the burden of TB and MDR TB has increased, uh, indicating that uh, we have failed to prioritize infection control to prevent transmission. So what is the way forward to tackle, say, drug resistance in TB and uh, other infectious diseases and also to increase focus on disease prevention? No, if, uh, as I said earlier, I think one of the things which was a major challenge in COVID-19 outbreak was handling the knowledge level or science literacy or biology literacy uh, within the population. If you even, if you think of HIV, because my background is from HIV, even now, after almost three and a half to four decades of efforts, you find that not more than about 80% of people uh, would be found to know, have accurate knowledge about it. Uh, so the bigger challenge is at least for COVID, uh, we have been able to somehow mobilize them in a manner that everybody understood that they have to wear masks, they have to maintain safe distance. We cannot neglect that fact. No, the issue is sustaining those efforts requires community mobilization and efforts to educate people. No, these are not things that will happen overnight. Today we are discussing this, but just reflect behind. No? No, if you look at SARS, the same issues were there. No, we changed for a very short period of time and when we found that nothing is happening, we stopped uh, using those. When it came to MERS, we perhaps uh, <laughs> neglected the whole thing. It was only in Middle East. You look at Keg, we talk about Surat as a cleanest city, but have other cities changed? No, <laughs> they haven't changed. I think when you want to sustain, use this opportunity of COVID, if you want to sustain what people had learned, the only way is to teach them why teach them how it can benefit them. If you don't do that, then for them, it becomes something which has to be done in a reactive manner to the threat that they are facing. But they have to understand threat is not only COVID, but it could be other respiratory diseases. It could, you need to change if you want to protect your life. But have we taught them? We have not. So basically, they have to realize that these threats are persistent. If I have to ensure my safety, there are certain core things that I will have to do. And if I do that, I will perhaps protect myself from certain diseases that may, that may occur to me. You know, like we talk of hand washing and we kept on saying that in, during COVID time, there were no cases of diarrhea. <laughs> that were occurring. But there is the effort now you know, to build on what we have done in COVID. If we, unless we spend more time on that particular thing, you will find 
that over a period of time people will even revert back to the mean no they they will not sustain those efforts and that can only happen through community mobilization and educating people how do we go about that yes people should know and people should be means from your experience can you suggest some uh, doable steps or steps at which uh, at different levels which need to be taken to uh, educate the community and people for sustained efforts i think what is most important is uh, you have panchayati raj as a system uh, which can keep on speaking because health is also their own mandate yeah. one has to understand so far we have been using top down approaches but now if you want sustainable change it has to be from it has to have a bottom up you have established nehru yuva kendra there are many mahila mandals that are already established in the villages i can't we activate them with simpler messages using panchayati raj institutions Uh, because you know health coming as a state subject or in the concurrent list tends to have only health related focus when you want to pro- message everything to a population which may not be sick at a given point in time so if if you want to capture such a population to my mind using the panchayati raj institutions using this in a strong collaboration with the health departments whether at state level or center will make a huge difference but those strong collaborations are extremely vital it is important to understand one thing that if we are able to emphasize the issue that this is likely to prevent like we talk of uh, covid no you will or even tuberculosis why do you think that any mother who may be sitting uh, in that maila mandal or for that matter in icds uh, if she has gone there or anganwadi you know, why why would she not try to protect her own child her own family they will do it but that messaging if it happens only from hospital setups it will it may not reach everyone and you won't have those vulnerable uh, or receptive movements what is also important is use panchayati raj system <clears throat> if you use panchayati raj system you will not only be able to uh, reach out to many very quickly but at the same time you will have peer support that will emerge at village level because if you know the message goes and there are out of 100 families that are there in the village if even 10 start they change you will find those 10 people would be agents of change people will slowly emulate them so to my mind no matter what the approach has to be bottom up and it has to have a strong collaboration at every level between panchayati raj institution and health whether at state or central level thank you very much thank you sir it was always so energizing to listen to you and to get your words and pearls of wisdom from you <laughs> friends we were listening to dr ganga khetkar a noted public health expert and epidemiologist and former head of the division of epidemiology and communicable diseases at the indian council of medical research thank you very much sir goodbye for now stay safe and stay <laughs> healthy thank you <laughs>